recurring recurrent relation equation which features an unknown value is one which leads us to a quadratic equation to solve. So in this case we're usually presented with a recurrence relation which has one unknown value, in this case p. So un plus 1 equals p un add 1. And they've told us that u0 is equal to 3. Part A would usually say something like, find expressions for u1 and u2 in terms of p. So that means we can't actually work out what u1 is or what u2 is, but we can find expressions which involve p. So to start this, let's copy down our recurrence relation underneath. Now we'll just follow our usual process. To find u1, we would substitute u0 in. So we get u1 is equal to p times u0 add 1. If we substitute our 3 in, then u1 is equal to p times 3 add 1. And this leads us to our first expression, u1 is equal to 3p add 1. And we're halfway there. We now have to find u2. Well, let's copy down that recurrence relation again. U2 will be equal to P times, well, U1 has to go in there, add 1. So U2 is equal to P times 3P add 1, add 1. And multiplying out that bracket, we will see that U2 is equal to 3P squared, add P, add 1. So we found expressions for U1 and U2 in terms of P as required. Now, usually in these questions, there'll be a part B. And part B will say something like, Given now that u2 is equal to 3, find the value of p which gives the sequence a limit. So part b has actually presented us with new information, u2 is equal to 3. So let's think about what we found already. u1 was equal to 3p at 1, and u2 was equal to 3p squared at p at 1. Well, we can get rid of the u1, we don't need that bit. We're only interested in u2. And it tells us that u2 is equal to 3. So if we bring that 3 down, we can replace the u2. So 3 equals 3p squared add p add 1. Let's forget everything else at this point. We just have a quadratic equation to solve. When we solve a quadratic equation, we always want to make it equal to 0 first of all. So that 3 on the left hand side can move over to the right and subtract. Leave the 0 behind, 3p squared add p minus 2 is what we'll get. Because 1 take away 3 gives us minus 2. So now all we have to do is factorise. So we get 3p minus 2 and p add 1. And you can pause the video for a second to convince yourself that that is the case. And that leads us to two solutions, p equals 2 thirds and p equals negative 1. In higher maths, when you get two solutions to a problem, you always have to be suspicious. In most cases, we will be asked to discard one of those solutions. If we refer back up to the question, you'll see it only wanted the value of p which gave us a sequence with a limit. So the condition for a sequence to have a limit is the value of p in this case must be between negative 1 and 1. So that value on the right hand side, p equals negative 1, is too small. It can be discarded. p equals 2 thirds is the only solution because p must be between negative 1 and 1. So 3.4 is recurrent relations with quadratic equations. So this time we're going to solve a quadratic equation to find our unknown values of uh, A usually. Okay, so it's recurrent relations with quadratic equations. Okay, so again, I'm just going to go straight into an example. Uh, I'm going to say it's example 3.4a. And the example will say, consider, and just to spice this up a bit, I'm going to use V instead of U. Consider v n plus 1 equals p v n add 3 with v 0 equal to 2. Okay. So part 1 is going to say express express v1 
and V2 in terms of P. So that means we're going to sub in V0 and get an expression for V1 and then sub that back and get an expression for V2. We won't be able to actually find out what it is because it will have a P in it. That's why it says in terms of P. And part two is going to say, given now that V2 equals 5, so this actually tells us what V2 should have worked out as, find the value of P, which produces find the value of P which produces a sequence with a limit. Okay, so I can read from that there's going to be two values of P, one of them will have a limit, one of them won't, and we want the one that, that gives a limit. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Solution. Right, so for part one, it's expressed V1 and V2 in terms of P. So how do we find V1? Well, to find V1 with a recurrence relation, we simply sub in the previous term, which is P, uh, V0. So it's going to be P times V0, add 3, just to be absolutely clear. We know what V0 is, it's 2. So it'll be P times 2, add 3. And that'll work out as 2p plus 3. So that is my expression for v1. It's as simple as that. When this comes up in your exam, every single person in Scotland will get that bit right. But it also wants an expression for v2. And there's a silly thing that sometimes happens here. People forget to go back to the original equation. So the original equation is p times the previous term. So the previous term to v2 is v1. Add 3. So that is P multiplied by whatever V1 was, add 3. Well, V1 was 2P, add 3. Multiplying out that bracket, we get 2P squared, add 3P, add 3. And that is my expression for V2 in terms of P. Okay, so V2 is equal to 2P squared, add 3P, add 3. Okay. For part 2 then I am going to use the fact that given now that V2 equals 5, so I'm going to use this. I'm going to say we worked out that V2 was equal to 2p squared, add 3p, add 3. They are now telling us that V2 is equal to 5. So I can replace this with 5. So 5 equals that quadratic equation. How do we solve a quadratic equation? Always the same way. We want to get it equal to 0, which means the 5 is coming over to this side and subtracting. So 3 subtract 5 gives me negative 2. And now the way to solve the quadratic equation is to factorise. So let's look at the first term first. 2p squared. How do I get 2p squared? It's 2p multiplied by p. How do I get 2? It must be 2 times 1. So it's either 2 times 1 like this, or it's 1 times 2 like this. It's going to be that one, because that will give me 1p and 4p. And I know that I can make 3p from that. I can make positive 3p by adding 4p and subtracting 1p. So it's 2p minus 1, p adds 2. Now we will split and solve. So if that times that equals 0, then either this equals 0 or this equals 0. And this implies that 2p is equal to 1, which implies that p is equal to 1 over 2. And this implies that p is equal to negative 2. Okay, so we've got to two possible solutions. And this happens all the time in higher maths. You get to two possible solutions. Whenever you do, you have to think to yourself, do I actually want two solutions? Blah, 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 blah. Find the value of P. So it only wants one value. 
it wants the value of p which produces a sequence with a limit. So if p were negative 2, if that number in there was negative 2, that's going to have no limit. That's going to ping pong and then disappear to infinity. If p was a half, then that's going to converge towards a limit. So this one is the one we want. And this one gets discarded. Now when you are discarding, don't scribble it out so I can't see it. Put a line through it, but make sure I can actually tell what it said. So p is equal to a half is the only possible solution. Now you have to explain why. So we are going to say since negative one is less than a half is less than one. So we've picked that one because that was between negative one and one. And we know that that is the condition for a limit to exist. So p equals a half.